All right. Happy Thursday, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is a part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 97,000 computing professionals and students who make up ACM's membership. I'm Matt Farmer, Senior Software Engineer on the Data Systems team at MailChimp, where I build streaming data applications on top of Apache Kafka. I'm an avid lover of all things open source and a maintainer for the Lyft framework and the Dispatch HTTP library. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or uh, what it has to offer, here's some more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen now. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines. Access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature. Internal conf international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, and support for education and research, including curriculum development and teacher training, and the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows or Command R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. You can also close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, simply adjust the master volume on your computer or device. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Neha speaks, and she'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Check on the learning.acm.org website for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. Finally, at the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. You may also open the link to the survey at any time from the resources window on your screen. In addition, you can use Facebook, the Facebook and Twitter widgets at the bottom panel to share this presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACMLearning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We, we also have a new community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we won't be able to get through during the Q&A session. Today's presentation is Journey to a Real-Time Enterprise by Neha Narkede. Neha is co-founder and CTO at Confluent, the company behind Apache Kafka. She's also the co-creator of Apache Kafka, and prior to founding Confluent, Neha led Streams Infrastructure at LinkedIn, where she was responsible for LinkedIn's streaming infrastructure built on top of Apache Kafka and Apache SAMHSA. She's one of the initial authors of Kafka and a, and a committer and PMC member on the project. Neha, without further ado, take it away. Thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction. I'm really excited to be here to do this talk. Um, you know, there was a little bit of background on what I'm going to talk today. Uh, I've been working in this real-time data and stream processing space for several years now. And as part of my job, I get to talk to companies that are completely digital 
and naturally data oriented. There are lots of those in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. But I also get to talk to a lot of brick and mortar companies that are transforming themselves into fully digital ones. And the common theme that I see in this transformation is the rise of real-time data and stream processing. And that's what I wanna put forth in this talk today. I wanna to talk about a simple thesis that I'm witnessing here. And that is the birth of a new category of infrastructure software. And this new way of thinking about your data is not something we've had to do very often as an industry, right? If you've been here long enough, you've seen this kind of thing happen with relational databases and data warehouses and search engines. I think this whole area of stream processing and streaming platforms and what's happening with Kafka is going to be like that. And so the bold claim I'll make here that I'll support through this talk is that I think streaming platforms could be as big and as um, you know, important of a technology as data warehouses and even relational databases. So that's what I'm gonna dive into today is this emergence of this new category of software and what it means in uh, the industry and the world. I think we've seen a number of these categories emerge um, you know, before us, right? Uh, in the previous decades, there's been the whole relational database uh, systems and business applications and dynamic web apps that it supported. We had data warehousing for BI and analytics. We had search engines like I'd previously mentioned. And I think what we're watching now is the emergence of another category that might be as big as each of these. But then what's the evidence, right, that such a thing might be happening? Let's look at Kafka's journey thus far. You know, it started with adoption in the Silicon Valley, um, you know, where a lot of these digital companies adopted Kafka in the early days. And this was about, this journey started about seven years ago. Not only that, over time, uh, in the last couple of years, it has really made its way into the enterprise companies and where today Kafka is used for supporting mission critical applications across really thousands of these big enterprises. Today, we know that about, you know, even a third of Fortune 500 uses Kafka, and that is across six of the top 10 travel companies, global banks, insurance, telecom, and, and many more. And so everyone kind of knows that there's, you know, something happening when a new technology makes its way this quickly into the mainstream market. And, um, you know, what's powering all this is the emergence of uh, what we're calling the streaming platform, right? This is what is powering the move from batch to real time. This is the architecture of these tech companies and these digital companies. And this is something we think is destined to be a major technology platform in the world. So what is the role of the streaming platform? You know, from what I've seen, it is to sit at the center of a company and be able to interconnect all the microservices, capture streams of events from applications, connect data systems, and do all this in real time and at global scale. A streaming platform is what allows a company to tie all of its data together and really have a central nervous system that represents everything happening in the business in real time. So let's look at you know, why there's so much momentum built around this new category of technology and what problem is it really solving? What's leading to its need? To understand that, I wanna start by looking at the world that some of us might find ourselves in. I call this the pre-streaming world. The pre-streaming world is complex. You know, data is stuck in legacy systems in various silos. There are lots of these point-to-point -point connections as a result, and that makes your data architecture brittle and lossy. Data moves around in bespoke batches. It's processed in a batch fashion. Essentially, in this pre-streaming world, all the focus and time is spent about worrying about how to land data in all the right places. But that is focus and time taken away from building responsive event-driven applications that really model how digital businesses are run. And I wanna just make it clear here that this isn't just about 
moving away from batch to real time, it's also about simplicity and agility, how fast we all as developers can move to evolve our applications, right? This traditional request response application architecture that you see here, this might be pretty familiar, right? This works, it is deterministic, but it is uh, really rigid. There's a tight temporal coupling between the originating service and the application and all the downstream services. This may work, but over time, this tight coupling can lead to cascading failures. If one of these super interconnected services breaks down, it leads to a lot of these cascading failures that is hard to manage. But if you contrast that with event-driven applications, you know, the same architecture is built very differently. Here, the event source and the event destinations and the downstream services, they're loosely coupled, right? They're loosely coupled and what's coupling them is the streaming platform. The application here is the event source, but it doesn't immutably dictate all the downstream processes. All it does is it publishes the event and then it passes control over to the event handlers, which are the downstream services, because the core belief here is that the course of action is determined at runtime. The course of action and the service and its business logic can change depending on changing context. The underlying assumption here is that services need to evolve over time, and that should be done without impacting all the other services. So event-driven applications, as a result, are responsive, but they're also flexible and easily extensible. So you might have heard that Kafka and streaming platforms, they power the transformation from pre-streaming to event-driven architectures, but what does that really mean? You know, moving away from this pre-streaming world to an event-driven world, it doesn't necessarily mean ripping out your request response application paradigm and replacing it entirely with an event-driven one. But it is much more about significantly supplementing request response with event-driven architectures, wherever it makes sense. So your transactional applications that really depend on a database, those should still happen using request response paradigm, but all the other downstream processing and a lot of the other asynchronous processing applications, they should move to event-driven architectures. In its full form, I've observed that event-driven applications constitute about 50% of a company's business logic. So it's really material. Now you might think, you know, haven't we seen this promise before, right? We've heard about event-driven architectures before, but why hasn't it really worked as advertised? Now, there are these different classes of technologies that have attempted to deliver some part of this event-driven promise over the decades. But the reason it didn't take its full form at company-wide scale where it could become the central nervous system is because there are core architectural deficiencies that prevented these technologies from addressing the needs of a true event-driven organization, right? So they didn't address all aspects of the problem, but certainly address some aspects of it, right? So on one hand of the whole spectrum, we have message-oriented middleware, MQs, the ESVs, and enterprise application um, integration tools. And they were designed to handle quick, low volume, but real-time data flow. On the other end of the spectrum, on the very right, you have the ETL tools, and they were designed to handle slow, large volume, but scalable data flow. So with these two ends of the spectrum, it really leaves this big chasm in the middle, and that chasm is asynchronous event-driven processing. So why is this relevant today? It's, it is relevant today because the world has really changed. There are these several big trends at the heart of digitization of business. Now, events today and data are not just produced by human actions, but they're produced by devices. 
with the whole rise of the Internet of Things, we're going to have millions, possibly billions of devices in a couple of years that would generate events that would need to be processed in real time. There's this whole trend of microservices breaking the monolith into several little microservices that then need to exchange data in real time. The rise of mobile has changed customer expectations where things are assumed to be in real time to begin with. And machine learning and the rise of machine learning applications, even though we're pretty early in that cycle, really relies on a strong foundation of data integration that is both real time as well as complete. So the problem is the last generation solutions were fragile and manual, but they didn't really scale to the needs of these big trends, which lie at the heart of the modern digital business. But that is what we wanted to solve with Kafka when we started seven years ago. We imagined the existence of a modern global, you know, self-service cloud-ready data system for the event-driven organization. So then what is needed to make this transition to an event of an architecture if you believe in one? I wanna make it clear that it isn't just about adopting a different technology, but it is about changing how you think about data in your business. It's about making a fundamental shift to event-centric thinking, where you're continuously capturing, assessing, responding to streams of events that matter to the business. And this is a really different way of thinking of your data. And it starts by being clear about what an event is. You know, the simple definition of an event is just that something happened that mattered to your business. And it's really that simple. You know, businesses are constituted of several different types of events depending on what that business is, right? See, there, there are all these examples from different types of businesses. There's a sale and a shipment. There's an order and an invoice. There's a trade happening. And there's some aspect of a customer experience. And if you look at all these examples, you'll realize that these are things that should happen all the time. So these are events that are continuous. These are events that are streaming in nature and they are infinite by nature. And so the thing to ask, question here is why shouldn't we capture this data and respond to it in the moment as it arrives and treat it as a series of events versus a static pile of data, which is how we've been conditioned to think of data so far. So to make this concrete, the definition of an event is just that it's an immutable record that records something that has happened at some point in time. And so going back to you know, my recommendation of changing to event-centric thinking, this idea of capturing your data stream of events and representing changes in state is really fundamental. It's at the heart of distributed systems it's at the heart of the concept of data replication, and it's at the heart of stream processing. And the bold claim I want to make here is that all your data in a business can be thought of as streams of events, whether it's database change logs or business events, like the examples I showed earlier, or a combination of the two. The reality is you can represent if you wanted to all your data as a stream of events. And how does this practically just relate to how a business works? Well, a business is just a series of events and reacting to those events. Now, to show you a couple of examples of organizations that are rapidly transforming themselves into event-driven ones from various you know, walks of the industry, my favorite example is that of the Norwegian Work and Welfare Administration and their Life is a Stream of Events initiative. Their vision is to put event-centric thinking into practice for the welfare of all 5.2 million citizens of Norway. Their vision is to make the government work for the citizens proactively and in a timely manner. 
they don't want citizens to worry about you know these big life events and all the things that have to be done manually across the different departments to get the relevant benefits. What is their solution? They're putting Kafka at the heart of this event-driven government organization. Each of these life events that you see here, they trigger a message in Kafka that triggers a whole bunch of downstream event-driven applications and processes that constitute a whole bunch of benefits to the organization from reducing welfare crime in real time, increasing efficiency of how quickly citizens get the benefit. NAV's vision is to be a model for all governments around the world to put event-centric thinking into practice to really contribute to the happiness and welfare of all citizens in real time. So that's from an example from the government. The next example I want to show here is Audi and Audi's Connected Car Initiative. Their vision is to collect event data from about 850 sensors from every car's onboard processors and use that data to power several functions that are critical to Audi. This ranges everything from identifying issues with cars sooner and, and notifying the driver, preventing losses from returns or costly repairs as they will be able to detect all the issues and track them sooner, also alerting drivers about obstacles in the road so they can save time and avoid accidents, and longer term, also enabling Audi to really learn about how their cars behave and provide insights into how drivers are using them so all that data can later be used to inform their future service and product offerings. Audi has selected Kafka as the streaming backbone for this entire unified platform for not just Audi, but the entire Volkswagen group of connected vehicles. Now, the interesting thing is data will be collected from these cars using an MQTT-based proxy. It will be streamed in real time across several regional hubs throughout Germany over the cellular network. Yes, streaming sensor data over cellular networks can be expensive, but Audi believes that the data is much more valuable than the savings in network costs. So beyond Audi, I see this trend of capturing streams of events and really changing how the business works across the board in IoT. Event-driven architectures here are the need. They're not just a shiny new, nice to have technology. Another example is from the banking industry. Right? My favorite example of an organization that started with this pre-streaming world and progressed all the way to you know, having a central nervous system is Royal Bank of Canada. You know, just a few years ago, they started their streaming journey with the goal of freeing data from mainframes by streaming it to Kafka. And today, they've not only done that, but they have 30 plus use cases across 50 plus applications that runs across 10 plus different lines of businesses. They all tap into the central streaming platform and power everything from a transformation away from mainframe-based monolithic applications to cloud-native microservices, to lowering anomaly detection time from weeks to real time, to sharing data easily across business units and even business partners. Now, this event-driven architecture is really transforming how RBC works as a modern event-driven bank. So with that introduction, you know, I, to event driven architectures, I said that you need to adopt a different way of thinking to succeed with event driven architectures. That's necessary, but it's obviously not sufficient. You do, of course, need the technology that enables this event centric thinking. And this time around, it needs to enable that at organization wide scale. That was our core motivation behind building Kafka, is the vision of a streaming platform that becomes the central nervous system of a business. But the question is, what does it really mean? You know, it's a new term. What is a streaming platform? There are a set of core capabilities around data streams that a streaming platform enables. And let me just go through each one of those. So the first one is the one we most understand. It's the ability to publish to and subscribe from streams of data. 
And that's something that's been around for a while. Messaging systems have been able to do this. What's different now is the next capability, which is the ability to store data and do it properly in a replicated manner. This ability to persist data in real time and at very large scale is really the true reason why a streaming platform can fully decouple applications from data systems and yet be able to integrate them because you don't fear running out of queue space. And all these capabilities link closely and they're related to the last one, which is the ability to process these streams of events. And that's really where the power of a streaming platform comes through is for it to be a foundation for joining streams of data, for joining streams of events with tables. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. So initially what started off as a messaging system over the years Kafka has evolved into a full-fledged distributed streaming platform that really embodies the quintessential characteristics of this new category of software. So when people encounter this new notion of a streaming platform, they actually come from a variety of different backgrounds and each background leads them to viewing this technology in a slightly different way. Let me just go through each of these three lenses as some of you might find a couple of these lenses to be familiar. So the first one is the messaging done right lens. And there's been this whole category around real-time delivery of messages between applications. And many people would just see Kafka and a streaming platform as the evolution of messaging. I think there's definitely a lot of truth to this view. A streaming platform does support many of the kind of core applications that messaging systems are used for. And there are plenty of efforts out there in the industry to replace MQs with Kafka, but Kafka is a lot more than a messaging system and seeing it that way is overly limited, right? There are at least three big differences. First is that Kafka in the streaming platform is actually built as a modern distributed system. You know, it can scale to the scope of the entire company, whereas messaging systems could only support one or a handful of applications. That seems like a small difference, but it actually completely changes its impact into, to an organization. It isn't just that Kafka can handle more messages than a traditional messaging system. It is that Kafka can run at company-wide scale and can be a backbone, not just for one application, but for dozens or hundreds or thousands of microservices. Because it can scale and has a proven ability to run this way for some of the largest companies of the world, it can actually act as a true integration plane across the company. And that was one of the promises of event-driven architectures. The second, as I had previously mentioned, is Kafka is a true storage system for streams of data. You know, there are Kafka clusters out there with over a petabyte of data in them. There are some applications and some companies that store data in Kafka forever, like New York Times. You can store data indefinitely in Kafka if you wanted to. And the storage capability, it turns out to be critical for many patterns. It is required for integrating the batch and the online world. So there isn't a big chasm in the middle. And it is required for unifying a lot of offline and real-time processing so that both your you know, analytic jobs as well as the application, they rely on a single source of truth. And the final capability and, uh, and the reason Kafka is way more than a MQ is that it is ability um, it has the ability to support rich stream processing kind of applications. Not only is this possible through the native streams API in Kafka, but a majority of stream processing systems are specially built to work with the streaming abstractions that Kafka provides. And they really only provide their full capability when used with Kafka or something like that. So the second lens is the Hadoop made fast lens. Um, 
you know, this lens suggests that you can view a streaming platform as kind of a real-time version of Hadoop or a data warehouse. There is actually a lot of truth to this view as well. After all, a data lake or a warehouse, you know, just like these two categories of technology, Kafka can act as a place where data comes together from across the organization. And now Kafka also supports a kind of rich SQL layer that you have come to expect from a data warehouse or Hadoop. It's called KSQL. The key difference between Hadoop and Kafka is that whether it is queries, jobs, or applications that run against Kafka, they're most naturally built to update continuously with every single event instead of in a batch fashion. So to show you an example of KSQL, you know, here you, what you can do is you can create streams and tables from Kafka topics with simple KSQL statements, which means that you can peek inside Kafka topics, you can write filters, aggregates, and the real power of KSQL is when you can join streams with tables. Tables in KSQL are different, right? They're updated with every single event arriving on the underlying Kafka topic. And that's the key difference between Hadoop, Data Warehouse, Relational Databases, and um, Kafka is this notion of a continuous query where you push streaming data as it arrives through a query versus the reverse, which is issuing queries to update views. And this distinction really is essential and it's a really big step forward in realizing the vision of materialized views in databases and bringing that to a company-wide scale. KSQL and Kafka are designed to produce streaming materialized views that are updated with every single event, unlike in databases where you have materialized views, but you have to read on the query, and that is really inefficient for a database. So because of this you know, existence of KSQL, and this was only released a couple of months ago, it has been downloaded several thousand times, it has been integrated into other analytical tools, and it has been used to do a series of things from anomaly detection to streaming ETL to real-time monitoring and much more. But coming back to the lens and how different it is, you know, the core difference here is that the applications really change their shape and behavior when built on top of a streaming platform. You know, to put this in context, data warehouses and Hadoop they're actually really good at what they do. They're a center of BI, center of reporting, and that supports a lot of traditional applications that are built around the warehouse, like, like reports, as you can see here. I think the streaming platform is unlikely to displace these established tools anytime soon. It's not the purpose of a streaming platform. Where the warehouse Hadoop tend to suffer is where you're trying to build applications that directly feed back into the business. So these are examples, right? So for wrangling reports, a batch ETL cycle may make life much simpler, but for powering a richer and much more real-time customer experience, that is a non-starter. You know, the, your customers don't understand data that is 24 hours late. The simple mechanics of building a product like this, which is based on batch cycle that feeds back into a you know, business application is huge. So I think domains where a streaming platform really shines are those kind of things, you know, we highlighted in these use cases and some of those queries. These are not examples of reporting on the business or analyzing it after the fact. These are examples of applications that power a real-time business. So that brings me to the last and final lens for viewing a streaming platform, which is about ETL and data integration. You know, there have been a whole 
generation of technologies that handle data movement, right? I, I showed some of them on a slide earlier in the talk. We have ESPs and EAIs meant to solve application integration problems. You have ETL um, tools meant to solve data integration problems, mainly related to the warehouse. And they give you a hard choice between scalability and flexibility on one hand and latency on the other. One view, and this lens on the streaming platform, is kind of a unification of these two concepts and up-leveling of this. Um, in Kafka terms, the E and L are connectors. They're Kafka connectors. They plug into existing systems. And the T is stream processing, whether it's KSQL or Kafka streams or any other stream processing layer. It's the streaming transformations that you can do on top of the Kafka log. So what is an example of you know, connectors? The, what the traditional view um, on ETL misses is the usage of a platform as an application development platform. The problem of ETL and data pipelines, it's not a tooling problem, it's an infrastructure problem and it should be treated as one. A lot of these connectors that you see here, and there are hundreds of these connectors in the Kafka ecosystem, they all share a common class of problems to do with fault tolerance, schema changes, you know, distribution of load. A lot of these common problems should be solved in a common data platform. And that's our view in a streaming platform is that these problems are actually solved in the streaming platform. Connectors programmed to common APIs like sources and sinks in Kafka's connect world and simply rely on the infrastructure underneath it to solve some of these larger problems. So today you can build streaming data pipelines with a growing ecosystem of Kafka connectors of all types and use KSQL or Kafka streams to process them, completing this full life cycle of E, L, and T. So all these lenses in isolation, they're incomplete, right? They don't communicate the full picture. I think these lenses make seeing the power of a streaming platform a little more challenging since each group has its own use cases and vocabulary, but this is actually part of the process of how we understand a new technology and a category that emerges. I think, in fact, it is a hallmark of a new category is that it cuts across a number of different use cases but in a way that wasn't possible before. So as I said earlier, you know, that this is the vision that we started Kafka with is the notion of a central streaming platform that powers everything from messaging to ETL to stream processing and really complements the relational database on one side, the data warehouse on the other, and a whole host of different data-oriented applications that rely on streaming materialized views built on the streaming platform. So if you believed in transformation to event driven architectures, and if you understand what a streaming platform is, then in the last part of the talk, what I want to introduce you to is the fact that it is a journey, right? This transformation from a pre-streaming world to an event-driven world, it doesn't happen in one go. It is a multi-step transformation journey where in each one of these phases, you address some unique needs of your organization, and it has a role that an event streaming platform must fulfill. You may start with a pre-streaming world on the very left, side of this axis. You, but when you start this journey, you start with awareness. You know, you, that awareness might look like this talk or simply you downloading and playing with uh, the Confluent platform. Then you start to go into early production, whether you're sucking data out of your mainframe or you're producing completely new events of data like Audi has. That In that phase, you're really just you know, putting a couple applications and onboarding them on the streaming platform without replacing anything that exists in your company, really. But then in the next stage, 
you know, you start to move to mission critical integrated streaming, you know, where where the banks are today, where they're moving fraud detection applications into credit card processing onto the streaming platform where things like security and durability really matter. And then the last couple of stages, you this turns into a true platform for your whole organization where you start to serve the global needs of your uh, business, where you have applications that need global availability of data, where you rely on a streaming platform to make it available. And in the last stage, where it becomes the central nervous system, uh, like RBC has today, where it truly does break down a lot of silos in the business, and you have a lot of data flowing through your central nervous system that is then available for stream processing. So what does an event-driven architecture look like in its end state? You know, at the end of that journey, what do you get, right? Um, first of all, this is a pretty powerful state for a business to be in, and the possibilities are immense. In this stage, everything happening in the business, it is an event. It is available instantly to all the applications in the company through the streaming platform. You don't have to do any kind of duct taping. You have the ability to query data as it arrives versus when it is too late, like when you were writing that key SQL query. And all this is possible by greatly simplifying your data architecture, by deploying a single platform at the heart of your data center, which is the streaming platform. And this is probably the largest and the most significant advantage to event-driven architectures. And the streaming platform is taking the mesh of connections away and replacing that with a clean platform at the center of your organization. That is what we wanted to enable when we started Kafka several years ago. And that is the mission of Kafka. We believe that you must have an open streaming platform around Kafka that developers could you know, adopt, whether it is downloading the platform or using a hosted service. And that's what Confluent Platform is today. It's an, a fully open source distribution of Kafka with uh, all the clients and connectors that you need to different data systems, with um, a schema registry to maintain schemas that is the reality of how data flows in an organization and KSQL, which allows you to complete the life cycle um, of your data integration by allowing you to process these events and really power the needs of a real-time business. So that's what I want to um, you, you know, leave you with is uh, an introduction to this new category of software, a thesis that the streaming platform area is really going to be one of the biggest and most exciting new categories of infrastructures uh, in our time. I hope that you took away a little bit about what event-driven architectures are and how a streaming platform fits in and why um, Kafka is popular today. Uh, with that, uh, I'd love to open the floor for questions. Okay, Matt is saying that he will paste the questions um, as part of moderating them. So the first one is, what about using this architecture in environments where real-time situation require quick responses, micro to milliseconds, like applying brakes in an autonomous car based on many sensor readings? That's a great question. So uh, let me frame the, you know, the spectrum of um, latency needs and where a streaming platform fits in. Um, today, you know, the way Kafka is designed it is, um, you know, designed to provide low latency in the 10 millisecond range, you know, 10 or sub 10 millisecond range, but certainly not in the micro, um, uh, um, you know, second range or anything that is uh, more real time than 10 milliseconds. So you may still have, you know, the trading applications on one side that you have to use these specialized MQs for ultra low latency applications. Then you have, you know, about, you know, 50% of your business that have these asynchronous applications. So you may be recording uh, a lot of these sensor readings. 
and you may be powering, you know, different applications in your business that need about tens of milliseconds uh, worth of latency. Um, but, um, and I think like that serves probably um, a large, you know, latency range from 10 milliseconds all the way up to, you know, however slow it can be. So all the way up to batch. And that's the whole, um, you know, gamut of uh, applications that Kafka and a streaming platform would support. So in the micro millisecond range, you would still need some specialized in-memory MQs. Okay, so let's see what the next question is. How do you recommend to increase resiliency of posting events to a queue like Kafka apart from just retrying? So Kafka is built to be resilient um, and durable as a system. So it has inbuilt data replication capabilities. Um, and the way this works is if you can configure the amount of replication and the amount of durability that you need for your application and every application's need, needs are different. And when you get that acknowledgement back for a group of messages from Kafka, the guarantee is that it has been replicated to those many, um, you, you know, separate machines. So the increased uh, resiliency part, it has also the other part, which is, oh, well, if you, you know, the reality of RPC is there could be network blips um, and you may have to retry anyway. And Kafka has, um, you know, item potency in exactly one's guarantees. So what we mean by that is when you retry messages that uh, we, and if you turn on um, the item potency in Kafka producer, which is turned on by default, it will be able to deduplicate de those messages that were retried because of a network blip. So Kafka is resilient to begin with, and it's, it is used for all sorts of you know mission critical applications um, where you have to depend on ordering of messages as well as reliable uh, distribution of messages. Great. So. We're waiting for the next question. Let's see what let's see what Matt picks. Are there practical limits on the sizes of messages and events? Yes, there are. Um, so Kafka, um, you know, today oh, and most recently, we made improvements um, to increase the maximum message size limit from one megabyte, where it used to be, to roughly ten megabytes. And anything more than that it will be challenging because then at that point you start to run into gar garbage collection issues. And uh, what we've seen is at, at that point in time, there may also be, uh, it may also be worthwhile to look into what your application is trying to do. So Kafka is not meant to be an object store. Um, so if you, when you're trying to move, uh, you know, videos or, you know, kind of multimedia kind of files around, the you know the recommended way of doing that in Kafka is to pass the metadata through Kafka and have it point to an object store versus actually moving the big multimedia type uh, data sets through Kafka. So I would say practical practical limit is around a couple of megabytes um, per message. And um, Kafka also does compression. So in reality, your messages could be much larger than that as long as they compress down to less than 10 megabytes. Great. So let's um, see what the next question is. Can you briefly summarize what makes Kafka stand out from competing streaming platforms like Flume, Streamset, NiFi, and MQ? Um, that's another great question. So. Um, I don't consider these systems to be a streaming platform because if I tie it back to the three lenses, um, all those lenses should be true for it to be a streaming platform. So stream sets and NiFi are more in the ETL category of systems, um, including Flume. And MQ is actually in the messaging category of uh, systems. So what is different between MQs and Kafka, I think we discussed the scalability persistence and it uh, enabling stream processing. The difference between
using these ETL tools, you know, NIFI, Stream Sets, Flume, is actually, um, it's a little bit different between Flume and NIFI and Stream Sets. So let's just talk about NIFI Stream Sets first. Um, NIFI Stream Sets is meant to be, you know, a, a slightly modern version of uh, what ESBs were supposed to solve is this uh, integration problem. The way they solve that is not through uh, relying on a streaming platform, but by creating these point-to-point -point connections between different systems. And while that may be a good starting point, A, that doesn't really rely on Kafka, so it doesn't really solve all the problems that Kafka would solve for you, so ordering durability of messages, single source of truth. Um, but B, it actually leads to the point-to-point -point mess that I sh uh, started the talk with, which is the pre-streaming world, is when you just deal with, um, you know, applications and data systems um, and think of ETL as a tool where you're connecting one thing to the other and just keep doing that, over time, as one of these connections break um, and you require um, a single view of your data, that's where it starts to become more complex. So a more uh, a parallel view of what Knife and Streamset solves is actually Kafka plus Kafka's connector ecosystem. Um, and so the problem there is it it would not um, solve for stream processing. It would not give you the ordering of messages and the durability uh, guarantees that Kafka provides. Uh, and with Flume, I think Flume is um, not a real time to begin with. So I think that's probably the biggest difference uh, between Flume, which is an ETL system, but uh, pretty batch in nature. So that's those are, I would say, the different um, differences. But um, I think at the high level, it's just that these satisfy one of these lenses, but not all three. And that is the major difference between these systems and Kafka. Great, so this was probably a longer answer. Um, can you describe in more detail how the full enterprise solution of Kafka manages schemas? What are the philosophies behind preventing an explosion of schemas like too many schemas describing a similar set of events. <laughs> okay, so part of this uh, solution um, can use a technology and part of it requires humans still. So the part of that, that technology so should solve and what Confluent Platform does is that it gives you the ability to define schemas and also define how they should evolve. So when you have schema registry, when you use it with the connectors in Confluent Platform, what happens is that where schemas change upstream, we actually manage transparently how the schema changes make it into the downstream system. So if your database field changes, your S3 uh, file is gonna get that field without your data pipeline breaking, which is where you currently are. Um, now, that is to do with you know schema storage and evolution but then how do you make sure that someone doesn't go in and define a different schema for what you semantically thought was the same data set and for that you actually still do need humans so um you know so the application you need is if you have a central kafka cluster is being managed by someone and you need to create a topic you still need uh, someone to you know ask um someone that could review your schema and just make sure that it is semantically aligned with uh, what a company might want. Now, they do need the information like what are the fields, how are they described, how are they supposed to evolve, all that the schema registry would do, but it doesn't get rid of the data architect in a company who should be looking at new topics and new schemas. Um, it is just that Confluent would enable that to happen through either UI or a REST proxy where you can view all the schemas and see how they're evolved. So, uh, you know, not a complete solution of what you might be expecting, but uh, you still do need humans in your company to review schemas. Let's see what the next question is. So brief thoughts on auditability, data versus logic version, and privacy 
like PII of data in the stream. Um, so let me see if I understood the question and um, uh, clarify what I think about these things. So um, brief thoughts on auditability. I, I think you need it. Um, and that's what we're building in Confer Enterprise. So what we uh, what you will get is the ability to and define roles, ability to define access control lists uh, based on those roles. So you can protect who can create topics, read, write data from those topics. And auditability, so an audit log on who is doing what, right? So who changed what access control list, who accessed which topics. So that's the audit log that you will get if you use Confident Enterprise. And a privacy, it's a whole gamut of things, but really um, what you need um, with PII is the ability to, you know, transform uh, messages and topics to obfuscate maybe fields or filter out some messages. And um, KSQL, along with single message transform capability in Kafka connectors, actually allows you to do some of that, where even though you're capturing the raw event stream, before that raw event stream makes it into your application or before it makes it into a downstream system, you need to do some sort of ETL. And that is what you know, stream processing as a solution would address. Um, and that's that's basically what I think about how you can do auditability and um, how you can, you know, manage some of the PII kind of needs. And uh, a lot of, you know, um, regulation, uh, regulatory requirements are around security and, um, you know, access control. And those are all the features that you will likely get, not in the open source version, but in Confluent Enterprise. Great. So we, I think, are about um, two, uh, maybe a minute away uh, at the top of the hour. Um, I still can't hear Matt. So Matt, do you want me to close? All right, everybody. Uh, I Please, just said... I'll let Matt close. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry for those technical difficulties. Uh, we are out of time for today. Uh, I'd like to thank Neha again. This has been a great presentation, uh, and she did a great job answering those questions. Uh, special thanks to everyone for taking the time to attend and participate. This uh, webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at webinar.acm.org. Uh, you can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and uh, the main ACM homepage at acm.org. Uh, also, please remember to fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers, uh, which you should see on your screen uh, momentarily if it's not up already. On behalf of ACM, Neha, and myself, Matt Farmer, thank you again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes the webinar.